Hey, y'all. Hey. Can you hear me in the back? Good? Okay. So I don't have any prepared slides because I find very often the most powerful thing we can do is, is answer questions and use one person's questions to teach 10 others and to, to jump off that question and to, to take it to where it actually needs to go to hit home. So that's what I'm going to do. These balloons are, they're, I mean, this one especially. Like, <laughs> yeah. No, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind. Yep. Be, yeah, 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 yeah. So um, first I want to just start by saying that what we're doing here, I want you guys to all understand this is a revolutionary act. <laughs> I was specifically asked by two women in the audience to walk around a lot. So I don't know what to do. I'll, I'll, I'll stay here-ish. How's that? <clears throat> Listen to me carefully. What you're doing is a revolutionary act. Being here, thinking like this, eating like this. You understand that it goes 100% against the grain of what we've all been taught in modern society. Have we been taught this or indoctrinated? Those words are sort of interchangeable. Uh, if, if your grandmother and your mother taught you to eat the old way, the way that made you sick, then that's, that you learned it. But if you learned it from television commercials and magazine ads and celebrity spokesmen, including Tony the Tiger <laughs> and the three little, are they leprechauns, yeah. whatever they are? Yeah, that's who, that's who taught me how to eat, watching Saturday morning cartoons, right? I was indoctrinated to think that that stuff was, first of all, food, <laughs> right? Because I feel like most people in this room have a different definition of the word food than most people walk in the streets, don't we? We've had the realization that the word food is not just some slang term you throw around. You know, I mean, if, if I handed you a dog turd and said, here, this is food, Every human would know to, that's suspect. That's not food. But if I handed you a bowl of Lucky Charms and said, here, this is food, everybody in this room would go, no. But how many people out there in the world would say, oh, okay, yeah, food, eat that? How many of your children would be deluded by that? How many of your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, how many of them would blindly believe that. Yeah, I saw it on TV. It must be food. Billion dollar corporations have a sneaky way of not selling you things that will kill you acutely. They know better than that. Their attorneys have counseled with the board of directors and said, if you, you know, if you feed people stuff and they die soon, an attorney will be able to take that case and then you'll have to write a big check. But if the food that you sell people, if it kills them slowly over 20, 30, 40 years, not just kills them literally, kills their life, but kills their health, kills their happiness, bottom, bottoms out their testosterone levels, causes autoimmune conditions, but it does it very, very slowly. An attorney's going to be hard-pressed to win that case. Oh, oh, we, they killed you over 25 years? Come on. Right? That sounds crazy in modern society, but we know in this room that's exactly what's happening to the people that we care about each and every day. Isn't it? In the United States of America, we believe that, certain, that people have unalienable rights, inalienable inalienable, however you want to pronounce it. Yeah, I think it means something if you pronounce it properly. It means more. 
okay? Would you, we have the right to free speech. We have the right to protect ourselves. We have the right to, to be in privacy of our own home. Would you also think that it should be a human right to have real food? Yeah, you do? I don't know, do you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and so we, we first have to know what's real food. You guys got that. Now, how many folks out there in the world who live in your neighborhood or in your, under your roof or next door don't know the definition of food? Yeah. Too many. Too many? Can they do that? So then how can they even know that they have a right to real food if, if you haven't taught them yet what real food is? Are you sure? Well, I was just say that I don't Some don't want to know. Yeah, I bet the vast majority do want to know. They may not know that they want to know. <laughs> but they want to know. They want to know. And so uh, I want all you guys, if I've helped your health in any way, I want you to pay me back. And I want you to do that by picking someone that you care very much about. It can be a relative or a friend or a special friend. I don't care. But I want you to help them to understand that there is a difference between fake food and real food. And that real food leads to health, health improvements, and that fake food leads to a miserable, early, suffering death. And then help them walk this way and eat this way. That's how you can pay me back. That's all I need. Now, I'd like to reserve the rest of the time without objection to answering your questions because very often people are like, yeah, I'm totally on board with keto. It sounds like it's awesome. All these people, it's transformed their life, but I've got fill in the blank. Can I do keto if I have fill in the blank? Or if I take fill in the blank? Or fill in the blank? So let's, let's take questions from the audience. And Joe's going to come around with the microphone so that we can, everybody can hear the question. You do one first, Mr. Joe, and then I'll, I'll take one from on right. this side. Oops. Thank you. I had one question, burning question I wanted to answer out on the cruise. Um, so I've lost 100 pounds and, re and gotten metabolically healthy. Huzzah! Yeah. yeah. Uh, over the past year, through my uh, health and, and gotten my anxiety under control, <laughs> my one question is that um, I have chronic AFib. Yep. And uh, it is my biggest health worry at this time. What can you help, uh, tell me to help me control that? Because that's my biggest fear is... AFib. Yep, got it. Anyway, I actually just had another AFib question in the back before I started. It's very common. As you get older, AFib becomes more and more likely to happen, and that's where the top part of the heart stops beating regularly, and it becomes irregularly irregular. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it does. And so it typically comes, as yours all the time or does it come in episodes because the other ladies hers would come in episodes you, you just have AFib so there's first of all multiple reasons you might have AFib you might have had a tiny infarct in the area around the SA node and so you just it's just not firing properly sometimes you can have an aberrant tract that's sending a false second electrical signal that that can be surgically corrected sometimes and sometimes you just got AFib Okay, but the thing, and so this also applies to anybody in the room with any heart condition whatsoever. Cardiac cells are striated muscle. They're cardiac muscle cells. They actually function more efficiently on ketones than they do on glucose. This, this matters in congestive heart failure, any kind of heart failure, cardiomyopathy, any weakening of the heart, the heart is going to pump more efficiently and more thoroughly and more forcefully on ketones than it is on glucose. 
And so if you're eating the standard American trash, you're going to be a sugar burner. And you're, you're gonna, your heart is not going to beat as efficiently as if you are in ketosis, some degree of ketosis, and able to use the ketones as fuel for the cardiac muscle cells. And that goes for AFib as well. Most people have episodic AFib. And what they notice as they get into ketosis is that, that the AFib, the episodes are less frequent, they're less severe, and they don't last as long. And uh, chronic AFib is, is, especially at your age, is a, is a much more rare condition. And I, I, I definitely your, your heart's going to beat more efficiently on ketones. Absolutely. I, I don't even hesitate to tell you that. But you may still, you may be one of those very few people who are still stuck taking one or two medications to keep the rhythm controlled and not be irregularly irregular. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barry. Um, last October, uh, I was doing. Sorry. There you go. Uh, last October, I had been doing keto for about two and a half years, and I had a minor heart attack. And the doctor pretty much convinced me that it was keto that, that caused it. Got put on all the medication that I had worked hard to get off of like uh, the statins, the blood pressure medicines, and so on and so forth. So what do you say to your new cardiologist and your doctor, you know, your family doctor for the past 20 years that, you know, they, you told them that you were doing keto, and they say it's a mistake, you shouldn't be eating all this high-fat food and everything, and then you go and you have a heart attack and the doctor's like, I told you so, you, you shouldn't have done this. So, a uh, great question. So first of all, what, let's define keto because defining words is very important to make sure we're using the same word. A keto diet is half your plate full of fatty meat and eggs with the yolk, half your plate covered with low carb veggies, a few nuts and a few berries. Everybody roughly agree that's keto, yep. right? Okay, how many, <clears throat> how many millennia have human beings been eating meat and vegetables and nuts and berries? All of them? All of them, yes. All of the millennia, yes. So that would, what your doctor said to you was just as ignorant as if your doctor had said, well, I told you you shouldn't be drinking water. That's a fad thing that people are doing now, drinking water instead of drinking Pepsi. I told you you shouldn't have done that. That would be just as ignorant. If your doctor said, have you been breathing pure air for the last two and a half years? Because that's exactly what caused this shit. Do <laughs> you get me? We have, humans have literally been eating meat and veg and a few nuts and a few berries just as long as we've been breathing air and drinking water and playing in the sun and pooping in the woods. <laughs> the entire time, that is, that is the proper human diet, that's it. So we've only been eating grains for about 10, 11, 12,000 years. Right? We've only been eating vegetable seed oils, vegetable oil, for about 100, 120 years. But yet they're healthier. So it, it's, in, at some point it comes down to just plain damn common sense. Right? Cats in the wild eat meat. Now cats eat kibble in captivity and they all have diabetes and they're fat and they have fatty liver and they're going blind. It must be the damn meat. Yep. <laughs> does, that, does that make sense? And so your doctor's currently ignorant. I'm sure your doctor means well. But there's this thing I, called, I call islands of ignorance. And we all have them. I have islands of ignorance where Chris Bayer could say something to me and I'd be like, shit, I didn't know that. We all have that. But some doctors don't have the honesty to say, shit, I didn't know that. Okay? 
So you're, cho- you're faced with a choice. Either change your doctor's mind with your continued existence as evidence or change your doctor. And learn to say no. But eating a proper human diet, there, there literally is no side effect of that except increasing the quality of your health and the length of your lifespan. That's all it's going to do to you. It, 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 it's just logically impossible that it would do anything else. Exactly. And so now, what if our friend here, what if he had been eating, how old are you? I'm 53. 53. He's a young punk. <laughs> what if he had been eating keto for 47 years and then started eating this high, highly processed grain standard American diet? And the doctor said, well, you shouldn't have been eating the standard American diet these last two and a half years. I told you, that's not good for you. Immediately, you'd be like, but he, for, for 47, what? Yeah, so you get it. You did the damage. The damage was done in the 47, 48 years. You were reversing the damage. And in many cases, there's damage that's been done, like you've developed big gallstones, or you've developed big kidney stones, or you've developed big lesions in your coronary arteries. And during the process of a proper human diet correcting that, you'll wind up having a gallbladder attack because before the gallstones were so damn big they couldn't get through the cystic duct. But eating a proper human diet, they're shrinking and they're dissolving. And when they get small enough, guess what? They'll fit in the cystic duct. They get stuck. You have a gallbladder attack. And the doctor says, see, I told you that damn keto. Look what it did. It gave you a gallbladder attack. Or your kidney stones are just so big they can't move, and a kidney stone in the kidney that's not moving is painless. You don't even know it's there unless you've had a CAT scan or an x-ray. Eating a proper human diet, it's dissolving. Your body's getting back to health. When it gets small enough, guess what it can do? And that hurts. (laughs) And then you have a kidney stone, and the doctor's like, I told you that damn keto was dumb. Why would you do that? But that's the most common thing I see is that as the damage is healing, there is a window of time where there's an opportunity for something to happen. And an ignorant doctor will say something like his ignorant doctor said. But you guys all understand that's his one life. That's his heart. That's her man. Then it becomes very scary because it feels like you're betting your life on something that if you don't really understand it, you're probably going to quit. But if you understand, no, this is not a new diet. This is not a fad. This is literally the diet that humanity evolved into Homo sapiens sapien. This is the diet we ate the entire time. By definition, if that diet was dangerous, we would be extinct as a species for eating that diet. Question. I was fascinated by Rachel's story about her mother through um, uh, CT scans for other reasons. It always comes up in my results that I have, and forgive me if I don't say this right, um, anthrosclerosis. Yep. And every time I see that on my CT scan, of course I'm asking my doctor, you know, what does this mean? And it's like, oh, that's no big deal. And so I just thought it was something I was bound to be stuck with because it wasn't going to be discussed with me. And so after hearing that, I'm basically ketovore, mostly. Is it possible I'll have a CT scan in the future that that's not going to be there anymore? Yes, it's very possible. (laughs) Yeah, so atherosclerosis is the buildup of plaque in the arteries. And, And the most dangerous plaque that you build up is in your brain arteries or your heart arteries, because they'll kill you if they, if they rupture, right? That's a heart attack or a stroke. But you have atherosclerosis all over your body. You can have it in your aorta. You can have it in your kidney arteries. You can have it in any artery. But yes, we, I've seen multiple, multiple uh, CAC scores, uh, CTAs, uh, MRAs of people who've been eating keto, ketovore, carnivore for years 
and they had whatever reason they had a CAT scan of their chest years ago and they had atherosclerosis. They had coronary plaque in their heart arteries or other arteries. And now that's regressed anywhere from 10 to 99%. Yeah. Now, just in the heart arteries, we know from talking to Dr. Arthur Agustin, who helped develop the CAC score. He also wrote the South Beach Diet, which when I read it, I was like, man, this diet's pretty legit, the first part. But then later, it gets dumb. <laughs> right? Uh, so he says that the average American, their CAC score goes up somewhere between 15 and 20% a year. That's the norm. That's average. And so if any of you guys have had a CAC score, and now you're hardcore keto, ketovore, carnivore, I highly encourage you to repeat it every 12 months. It may not serve a therapeutic purpose as in, oh, we, we will, the doctor will act on this to do something to intervene, but I want you to know the number. What's your CAC score? Who knows their CAC number? Yeah, I want you to repeat it annually and if you're, if you're doing sort of keto or dirty keto or half-ass keto, I don't want to hear your number. Okay, but if you're like, no, dude, beef, butter, bacon, and eggs, or meat, veg, few nuts, few berries. If you're doing that, I want to know what's your score each year. Because what you're going to notice is your score either doesn't increase at all, which is a huge victory. Huge. That's humongous. That's unheard of in cardiology, that the CAC didn't go up 15 20% a year. If it only goes up 10%, you're winning, okay? But many, many people's CAC score goes down. Has any, anybody in here, has your CAC went down? Well, it went from what to what? They didn't tell me. Oh, you didn't? They just said it's better. I was like in the top 85% several years ago, and now my arteries are so-called clean as the whistle. I never actually gave you the score. She went from 85th percentile to clean as a whistle in how many years? 20. 20 years. And so it doesn't happen quickly. You don't go keto and then your arteries are clean as a whistle after three months. It took a long, how many years? How many years did it take you to get those blockages though? Yeah. Oh, um, I was diabetic for 12 years. Diabetic for 12 years, but it was the keto. <laughs> <laughs> Doctors, listen to me carefully. This is very important. If you don't remember anything else from this conference, I want you to remember this. Doctors are just dudes and chicks, just like you. They are susceptible to every fallacy, every logical, uh, illogical argument, every failure of human nature. They are just as susceptible as you are. And in some of the logical fallacies, they're actually, the more educated you are, the more likely you are to fall for certain of the logical fallacies. Okay? So I'm, I, I want you to look at your doctor as a, as a learned health partner, because that's what they should be. They are not your doctor daddy or your medical boss. You are, it is your right to say, well, wait, I've got a few questions about that. And if you have to, get in between the doctor and the door. Seriously. Did you pay your copay? Then his ass needs to sit down until you're done asking questions. <laughs> Unless he wants to give you 10 or 15 bucks back. Hi, I, um, I fell, I hit my head, I have had a um, cervical effusion, and I have chronic vertigo from the concussion that they never really dealt with. It's been almost three years. And my words don't come to me all the time. Yep. <laughs> um, I've been keto for eight years. I don't know what else to do. I don't know if, if I don't take ke extra ketones, I don't know if that would help me. It, that's a great, so let's, let's, let's deal with that. So neurological injury, three years ago? Yeah, yeah, over three years ago. So what is the slowest healing tissue in the body? Brain. Nerves and brain, yeah. So uh, many people who've had a, a devastating neurological injury, uh, I would tell them in the clinic, look, you, don't, you do not give up hope until it's been anywhere from six months to 36 months. The brain, the nerves can do magical things, but they do it in slow motion, very, very slow. 
Uh, I, that was back 20 years ago, I used to say that. Now I would say, I don't want you to give up hope until it's been 10 years after the injury. With you pushing yourself, to use those words, pushing yourself to do things that, that are just a little outside your comfort zone. Okay? You get smarter by learning. Learning doesn't just happen effortlessly. Ask Beckett Berry, he'll tell you. <laughs> you gotta you gotta shut up and listen and then try to remember you can't be picking your nose and playing with your sister or you just get it doesn't work. And so neurological tissue only Im heals and improves and expands, grows, gets smarter under stress. But it can't be too much stress, right? So I want you to never, never give up until it's been a decade since the injury. Keep pushing, keep trying, keep doing a little bit more than you think you can, with, with, always with safety in mind, right? But I would not give up hope. No, I would not. But the only other thing I would say that you might get you in a little deeper ketosis and might get you a more nutrient-dense diet to feed those neurons, to feed everything that's trying to regrow, is to cut the carbs even more and to cut the potentially inflammatory plant toxins even more. I would try 90, 120, 180 days of carnivore beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. As I'm, But that's not going to fix it. That's just going to give you the building tools to potentially fix it. What's going to fix it is you not giving up. You getting off your ass, out of that chair, going for that walk that you're like, I don't know, getting up and talking in front of people like you just did. That literally will rewire your brain if you do that often enough. Okay? Does that make sense? Don't you don't dare give up. And, even, and so if, yeah, don't give up. If... If everything I just said, if you do it for the next 12 months and, and your symptoms get 20% better, would that be a victory? Yeah. I mean, obviously, I'm with you. I want it to go completely away. You're sick of it. I get it. But any amount of improvement is a victory. Any amount of regain that you never thought you would regain, that's, that's a victory. And I want you to look at it that way. The goal is not to be completely back to normal. The goal is to be better than I am now in a month, in three months, in six months, is to be better than I am now, for it to be less severe than it is now. That's, that's, that should be your goal because that goal is very attainable. So I've been taking a proton pump inhibitor like Nexium or Prilosec for about 25 years. Yeah. And I found you about three years ago on YouTube and started watching you and, and watched your video about using uh, apple cider vinegar. And it works for me every time for about three or four days. And then the heartburn and chest pain just gets out of control, unbearable. Yep. Do, you have, do you have any other strategies? Yeah, so you, away? you were taking a, which one? Prevacid, Nexium, Prilosec? Uh, Prilosec. Prilosec. So he was taking Prilosec every day for years. And I used to take two Nexium a day back when I was really fat and ignorant. I got all the Nexium samples when the drug rep came. My patients did not get any of those. I, I got them all. <laughs> I took two a day for years. Now I know that that was stupid of me to do that because I was increasing my risk of multiple long-term medical complications taking that, right? Because you're supposed to have a very acidic stomach. So he now can take apple cider vinegar and it gives him about three days of relief plus a proper human diet, right? Keto, keto, ketovore, carnivore, what are you doing? Ketovore, okay, beautiful, yeah. So now instead of taking a proton pump inhibitor once a day, he's taking ACV every third day. So, and it helps for about three days. So I'm gonna let them answer this for you. What should he, what should he do? Take it, take it every, thir every three days. Take it every two days. Take it every day. A thousand times I'd rather, a percent, I'd rather you take ACV every day than a proton pump inhibitor every day. Yeah, yeah. And keep, keep, keep a close eye on your diet because diet's huge for, for reflux. Okay? And t you can use the apple cider vinegar. I would try to do it every third day and see if that keeps it at bay. If not, do it every second day. If that doesn't do it, do, take it every day. <laughs> Yeah, stop eating four hours before bedtime if you can. Anybody still have heartburn on keto, ketovore, carnivore? 
Anybody? Whose heart burns better on keto, ketoville, carnival? Or it's completely gone or much, much better? Look around. Big deal. Big deal. Carn Carnivore's best. So keto, I went from taking two Nexium every single day to taking a shot of apple cider vinegar every other day, uh, Tums here and there. That's what keto did. So 85% better. But when I did that crazy carnivore challenge on my Facebook page, because of crazy Sean Baker, <laughs> I was like, let's do this crazy carnivore thing. I had no heartburn. It was gone. And I was like, I'm going to do this for another month. And I'm still doing it because my heartburn was egregiously bad. It affected my ability to speak. It was really bad. So, yeah, I'll, I'll never go back ever to the stupid way. But every now and then I cheat on carnivore with keto. <laughs> but that, that's not that big a deal, right? But I would just take it every other day and see if that, I think. That, and then one other thing, if any of you other guys still suffer from GERD, reflux, heartburn, on keto, ketoville carnivore, get two red bricks and put a red brick, it's gotta be a red brick, <laughs> under each head post of your bed. Raise the entire bed up two or three inches. Because even though you have symptoms during the day, the damage is done at night when you're lying flat in bed. That's when the damage is done. And that three inches is gonna keep the acid down in the stomach where it belongs. So your esophagus can heal for more hours a day than it would be able to heal otherwise. And for, the, like literally, I don't know of a human who's done the red brick under the head post plus either keto, keto, or carnivore and still has any degree of heartburn whatsoever. Those two things, I mean, gravity, that's the law, right? <laughs> gravity and the proper human diet, literally what can beat that? They both win every time. I have a hiatal hernia. And it still doesn't bother I have, you? I have not taken anything for heartburn in two and a half years. Yes. And I have a, mine's substantial. And I, I used to shoot x-rays in my clinic. And I read them because I was an x-ray tech before I was a doctor. So I'd seen tens of thousands of x-rays. And I wanted, when I went to med school, I wanted to be a radiologist because back then they made bank. <laughs> Bank like a half million dollars a year for sitting on their ass looking at pictures. <laughs> and, then, and then Ten Care came along, <coughs> Medicaid, and now radiologists, yeah, poor guys. Poor guys. But so I had had tons of experience reading x rays, and, and, and uh, doctors are, uh, even primary care, they are licensed to read x rays. And so I had a radiologist that would overread if I was like, shit, I don't know about this one. I would send it to him, and that happened about once a year. But I read all the x-rays, and so I shot an x-ray of myself, and I'm like, what the hell? Maybe that's why I've got re reflux. i got a big hiatal hernia. But, yeah, it was, it's a big one. But on carnivore, no reflux at all, ever. If I, if I transgress a little too much, like on the cruise, if I have too many little mixed drinks and too many little keto cheats, I'll start to feel it just just a 1%, like, eh, time to tighten up, because I hate reflux. Here with yes. Lori. Hi. Hi, Dr. Barry. Um, I'm really privileged. It's, a, it's been an honor to be on this cruise um, on behalf of a dear friend of mine. We're nurses together. And um, I've ex been experiencing, I worked uh, graveyards for 15 years, and now I'm retired from that. And um, I was diagnosed with a sleeping disorder that has to do with uh, not getting uh, appropriate amounts of REMs in the, in, during my sleep patterns. And even if I take sleeping medication, I only sleep for two or two and a half hours, and I wake up, and I can't go back to sleep. Um, I just want to know how yeah. the keto diet would possibly affect my ability to have more yeah. um, effective sleep patterns so that I can be awake during cruises <laughs> instead of sleeping. <laughs> yes, ma'am, yeah. And have you, you. Had, have you been tested for sleep apnea? <laughs> yes, I spent three days in the hospital. Um, and do you have it? In a program, they said, no, I did not have okay. sleep apnea. I had what they called uh, events, and I'd wake up. The one night that they had me strapped in with a million wires on my head, 
I woke up 32 times, and half of those times I woke up crying. And mm. they said they're not sure what it was, so they sent me to another a specialist who interpreted that, and he said it has to do with your REMs. You don't have enough REMs. Yeah, um, and you, you work graveyard shift how many decades? For 15 years 15 as years. a nurse. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So first of all, sleep. Any doctor who tells you that they understand everything there is to know about sleep is full of shit. Okay, sleep is super complicated. We've only scratched the surface. Uh, when I was a young punk, I was like, why do I got to sleep eight hours every night? What a waste of time. And it, I, heard it, I heard it said just a few months ago, I was listening to a book on Audible, and an anthropologist said, sleep is one of the very few behaviors that no animal has ever evolved out of. And thinking about, think about <laughs> sleeping 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 years ago. Hey, let's just all lay down in the middle of the night and become unconscious for eight hours. <laughs> that sounds like great strategy to get your ass eaten. <laughs> but not a single mammal has ever evolved a way to not sleep. They some sleep standing up, some sleep hanging upside down. But we all sleep and we do it, and, and if we don't, we suffer, we get sick and we die, the end. So I feel like that shift work is a sleep disorder. And actually there is a shift work sleep disorder now, it's an actual diagnosis. But uh, I know you got shift diff and I know that was sweet. I remember, but I wish that I could go back in time 20, 30 years ago, however long, and slap you around a little and say, please, it's not worth the extra two bucks an hour, three bucks an hour. Uh, because some people's sleep architecture is very fragile, and once you muck around with it, it can take a long time. And it, can it be permanent? Nobody knows because we don't know anything about the actual, the, the, the science of sleep. We don't know much about it at all. And so I would highly encourage you to pick keto, keto, carnivore, proper human diet, real whole food, one ingredients. I would encourage you to get out in the sunlight every morning. Let the sun shine on your face. Anybody in here dumb enough to stare at the sun directly? No. Okay, so I don't have to say that. Sunlight every morning on your face. That helps your circadian rhythm. That gives your body the wake up. Oh, this is morning, okay? But if you wake up and you turn on a lamp and you, you know, shuffle into the kitchen and do whatever and ever, no, that's not enough. How, how much brighter is sunlight than if you turn on every light in your house, every single one of them? Magnitude. How much brighter is sunlight? 50%, 70%? Magnitude. Orders of magnitude brighter. The human eye is magnificent at being able to block, okay? We're talking about thousands and tens of thousands of times brighter. So don't think, oh, I, well, I turn on all my lights. No, that's not the same thing. Go out in the sun every single morning, 10, 15 minutes. Get that wake-up call. Then be more active during the day. There's tons of research. The more active, a.k.a. the, the dirty word, exercise, that you're going to sleep a little better. Right, Dr. Vega? Right, Bronson? You sleep better the harder you work. And so I'm not saying join the gym and work out seven hours a day, but I'm saying let's start doing more than you've been doing, strenuous-wise. And I think you're going to notice that as you continue to heal your neurons and your axons and the myelin sheath around those axons, and you continue to lower the inflammation in your brain by eating a proper human diet, and you're tr retraining your body, because you've got 15 years of training that was upside down and backwards on when to sleep and how to sleep. And most people working shifts, they just wind up not. They sleep two or three hours, half ass sleep, and that's just, they just get by on that. They're a walking zombie. But they make that extra three bucks an hour. <laughs> right? I hope that helps, and I'm happy to talk about you later because it's a very complex, uh, big subject. Who else? Hi, Dr. Barry. Hi. I have been some degree of keto, proper human diet. I've gone all the way down to beef and salt mm. at different periods. No coffee, with coffee. Yep. Keto chow in my coffee is probably my favorite. That's but, tasty. Um, <laughs> um, 
I had that dip in pain and inflammation after several months of being keto consistently yep. for a while, but it went for a little while and now it's coming back up all my itises are coming back my sinusitis my dermatitis my bursitis my arthritis everything is getting worse and i have the stiffness and the inflammation again and i don't know what to do i often find that the answer to a person's question is actually included in the question that they ask (laughs) I didn't get relief from beef and salt, though. That's what I'm saying. But uh, how long were you strictly beef, salt, water? Almost 90 days. Okay, all right. That's that's a good try. So the vast majority of people who have aches, pain, stiffness, uh, whether that comes with a formal diagnosis or not, the vast majority of people get improvement. And you had some improvement that seemed Mm -hmm. to stutter around, but it didn't stick, is what you're saying. Yeah, now, so there are medical conditions that even if you eat a perfect human diet, you're still gonna have that condition. You're still gonna have those symptoms. But the vast majority of people, the symptoms get better, and they stay better as long as they behave. And so what I would say is you probably have an undiagnosed medical condition. And we see this very commonly. That's why Kim Howard and I wrote the lab book mm-hmm. is because the, the, the incidence of undiagnosed hypothyroidism is huge, huge. And so unless you've had the full thyroid panel that we talk about in the book, you don't know if you have hypothyroidism or not. Unless you've had your, the complete sex hormone panel checked. You don't know if you have low testosterone or low progesterone. I got All, those done. I just I couldn't interpret the, the gotcha. hormone. Well, you need myself. the book. You need the book. Then know you. <laughs> but or get with me later if you've got your labs. We'll, we'll look at them. But the, the the problem is is so many doctors are so busy trying to get you in and out that they forget what it means to be a doctor, yeah. and so you wind up basically getting half-assed, although you paid the full copay, didn't you? <laughs> Y'all might want to start negotiating with your doctor and say, you know, I felt like I got a half ass answer from you. Can I get half my copay back? <laughs> but I, I would encourage you to get the full lab panel and to, if you haven't already started exploring with specialists, you probably need to go see rheumatology, maybe neurology, and not just seeing your primary care doctor or an OBGYN. You probably need to go and say, look, I've fixed everything and I'm still having these symptoms, what have we missed here? And the average specialist, if you put it that way, mm-hmm. what has my doctor missed here? Think about that if you're the specialist. You're like, well, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just find out here what's been missed, right? And I'm just the guy to do it. <laughs> yeah, so I would approach it like that. And definitely, are you, is it going to harm you to eat a proper human diet? No. Is it going to prevent you from developing things in the future? Yes. So definitely continue to eat a proper human diet. But you're, I feel like your medical investigation is not complete yet. Okay. There's probably something missing. You've got something that you don't know you've got, more than likely. I'm afraid of that, too. Yeah, yeah that's what it <laughs> sounds like. I think we have uh, time for one more. All right. Okay. Um, I've been... Ketovore since or for about a year and a half now, um, pretty much have gotten everything better except my varicose veins, spider veins. Yep. Very achy. Yep. Hurts all the time. What can I do? Yeah. So vascular tissue also heals very slowly, and once a valve in a vein has been compromised, or once the wall of a vein has been compromised. I have not seen a lot of people with, especially the, we call them the ropes, right? The bigger varicose veins. I have not gotten feedback. And I get feedback from thousands of people. And I don't get feedback saying they're gone. Now, I do get feedback saying spider veins are much less noticeable, much smaller, or completely gone. I hear that a lot. But the big veins, you're going to have to go to the vascular surgeon for just a, it's a very simple minor procedure. They do it all the time. But for the big ropey varicosities, you're going to have to probably have those fixed 
surgically. And when I say surgically, that sounds bad, but it's, it's not surgery. It's a minor procedure that they can go in and fix that. But there's just been too much damage done to that vein. Does that make sense? All right. Let me, let me I want to just ask you guys a few questions, and I, I want you to just think about the answers inside your own head. If a kindergarten child has a, is a child of a single mother, and she's working two jobs, and that, so that child goes to preschool, goes to daycare, then to kindergarten, and is fed food that, that, that complies with the USDA guidelines. Is that child abuse? Is it? In your mind, in your heart, is that child abuse? Yeah, so if, 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 yeah, it's not deliberate, Chris Bear says, and I agree, uh, but is it still abusive? Yeah. What about if, if your grandparent or your aunt or uncle's in the nursing home? And not only are they fed according to the USDA guidelines, have you guys ever seen a nursing home meal? Is that elder abuse? So if you believe those things in your heart and you know these things in your mind, should you be doing something about that? However big or however small the action that you can have, whether it makes a big difference or a tiny difference, should you be thinking about that sort of thing and working on that sort of thing? Thank you.